What makes a great leader great? How do we create a high-performing team? And when we say leader, we mean everyone, because everyone is leading their own life. Will yours be a life by design or a life by default? Those are the big questions, and this podcast will answer them. Welcome to the Becoming Your Best podcast, where we help you apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders, because great leaders will produce great results. A quick message for you. We wanted to let you know that the Becoming Your Best 2020 planner has arrived, and as you're starting to set your sights on having an extraordinary year in 2020, this planner will be a tremendous resource for you. And we want to let you know that uh, particularly this year, there is a big time discount for you. They're here, they're ready to ship. So if uh, you would like to get yours on the way, just write to us at support at becomingyourbest.com. Support at becomingyourbest.com. And you're going to love this planner. Welcome to all of our Becoming Your Best podcast listeners, wherever you may be in the world today. This is your host, Steve Schallenberger, and we have a very interesting guest with us today. She is the founder and CEO of the Altimeter Group, a disruptive industry analyst firm that was acquired by Proper in 2015. So welcome, Charlene Lee. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. Oh, you bet. Excited to have our discussion. I've been looking forward to it. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Charlene. Not only is she the founder and CEO of the Altimeter Group, she has over 20 years of experience in tech and business and has been a respected advisor to Fortune 500 companies, especially on digital transformation and leadership. And for the past two decades, Charlene has been helping people see the future. Okay, I can't wait to see the future together today, Charlene. (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be fun. (laughs) It is. And she's the New York Times bestseller author of six books, including Groundswell, Winning in a World Transformed by Social Technologies, and the new book, The Disruption Mindset, Why Some Organizations Transform while others fail. And Charlene was named one of the top 50 leadership innovators by Inc. and one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company. So congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, well, Charlene, before we get going, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and including any turning points that's impacted your life to where you're at today and where were you raised and help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, um, I was born in Detroit, grew up in Detroit area to two uh, wonderful parents who immigrated to the United States and great childhood and everything in Detroit and then left it to go to school back east at Harvard for undergrad and then went back to Harvard Business School after a bit of consulting. And I did something a little bit unusual coming out of Harvard Business School where most of my peers were going to consulting or investment banking. I went into newspapers because it was 1993, the internet was just beginning to come out. And I figured that being in Silicon Valley, working for a company that was going to be at the very front lines of moving into the digital space, newspapers with all its daily content, would be a really interesting place to be. So that was probably the most significant pivot that I made. Again, going into newspapers was just not seen as something you would do. And I did it and made a bet. And that's really paid off because it gave me a front row seat to the internet being born. Wow. Yeah. And talk about change. What an industry of change, right? Yeah. And and again, when I went there, there was no World Wide Web. Just to give you an idea, I was working with the Science and Mercury News and we were one of the first newspapers to go online. And I was helping our advertising department figure out what does a banner ad look like? How do you sell it? What's the value prop? What size is it going to be? How much do we charge for it? What's the value behind that? And so being able to understand what is it that people really value and also advertisers and creating a business around it was was really fascinating. Oh, well, that's great. Well, thanks for that background. That's wonderful. Harvard's a great place. I enjoyed being there. And it's so fun to be able to have that experience and then go out in the world and see if we can try to make a difference, right? 
And and I think one of the, the things I learned from there is that it, your career is something you have to absolutely manage. You have to spend time on it. Just thinking just strategically about what I was doing in newspapers and what I wanted to do next was a really important value that, that Harvard implanted in my brain because that's not something you would take away as necessarily something you, know, you think about. You're learning about spreadsheets and strategy and all these other things that you learn as an MBA. But probably the best course I did was how do you think about and manage yourself? The biggest asset you'll ever manage, which is yourself and your career. Yeah. That was really instrumental. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. I, I like to say that people spend more time managing their music playlists than they do managing their careers, <laughs> which is, if you think about it, not a good indication of what how, how what our priorities are. That's like one of the things that I continually did. And, and a key point in moving from newspapers and becoming an analyst and starting my company and, and continuing to, to pivot and to grow has been something that, that's really uh, helped me just continually think about where I am. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. More time in their playlists and managing their playlists and managing their careers. And I might add managing their lives where, you know, it's a whole package and they're very much interrelated. Now, let's jump right into your, your new book, The Disruption Mindset. I'm excited to talk about it. I had the opportunity to get a copy of Charlene's book in advance and had the chance to read it. I love it. They're really fun ideas. We'll talk about it today. And I think that this will be interesting for leaders anywhere that are managing change, managing disruption, and they are a bit different. You know, change is ever present. Uh, I think disruption, it's either going to happen to you or it's something you do by design. One of the things that Charlene talks about in her book is disruption doesn't take days off. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Yes, I, I like to say that disruption isn't something you turn on and off at your convenience. It isn't something that's relegated to one department in your organization. And it's very uneven. So you never quite know when it's going to hit. So you always have to be on the outlook, uh, on the lookout for it. But when it does come and when you go looking for it, some amazing growth opportunities come your way. Okay, well, let's just talk about this because when, when you talk about this, you talk about approaching disruption backwards and then how to turn the tables for future breakthrough growth. So how does that work? Well, I think in many ways, we keep looking for some disruptive technology or disruptive innovation to drive growth. And that's backwards because it's actually growth that creates disruption. I talk to a lot of companies and ask them, like, what's keeping you from growing? And they talk about all these different things. And it's usually not because they don't know what they could be doing or the technology isn't there. It's the fact that if they were to grow exponentially more than they are today, it would cause so many problems for the organization. It would be hard. It would be very disruptive to their sense of order. So they don't step into it. And disruptive organizations do just the opposite. They have the mindset, yeah, yeah, it's going to be difficult, but it's worth going at it because we're going to grow exponentially. Okay, I, I love that perspective of it and how to think about it. Good job. So how do you create a strategy? You talk in your book about really being focused on future customers. So how do you create a strategy that's inspired by future customers, and then you also talk about how to make a big gulp decision. Tell us what those are, and then how do you move in that direction? Yeah, again, I kept getting asked by people, like, so what's the right strategy? What's the best strategy to create disruptive growth? And when it came down to it, all these organizations did one thing and one thing particularly well, and that is they focus on the future customers, and they align the entire organization around the future customer. And the reason why that is so important is if you know who you're trying to serve, then today you're going to make the investment, dedicate the resources, make the sacrifices you need to in the present day to ensure that you're going to be able to do this in the future. And most organizations, when I ask them to ask to see their strategy plan, they pull out a, a plan for the next year. And I'm like, that's, that's not a strategic plan. That's a budget of how you're going to meet short-term objectives. Where's your plan looking out three, five years? What do you think the future looks like? Who do you think your future customers are? And it's so important to be able to take care of your customers of today, but I can almost guarantee you your customers of today are probably not the customers of the future. 
So that's the, the key difference that disruptive organizations are really focused and aligned around that future customer allows them to think into the future and not just for today and the status quo. So I think for me and maybe for some of our listeners, the idea, the challenge of identifying and trying to understand what a future customer may look like could be a daunting challenge. And so what of what what are the best ways to get the answer? To, what do my future customers look like? What are your best practices? How do you zero in on this, Charlene? Yeah. Like there's a shortcut way, uh, which is take a guess. <laughs> do your best guess of who your future customer is, right? And and the reality is Everybody in the organization will probably have like a different idea, but you start to center around some ideas. You spend some time on it. Like I think it's here, it's probably there, but starting with a hypothesis and go and do research. Go and create what I call an empathy map because it's not really identifying them completely like what jobs they have, what titles or their psychographics or demographics. An empathy map says, This future customer, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they saying? And what are they doing? And so I may not know all those specifics, but if I can put myself into their shoes, understand their needs, where they are, and how we could potentially solve those needs, then that actually is a great way to align people around who that future customer is. And it's so much more powerful than some organizations using, for example, personas or customer journeys. Those are really powerful tools, but they almost never make it out of the strategy planning and the design phase of of a product or a service. We're talking about having a model of the future customer that everybody in the organization can see and understand. And when you see that future customer or just an inkling of it, then you can send up the flag, put out the announcement, I got one here. Come in, everybody. Go go look at this because let's go study them, really understand who they are. But you can't do that unless you know what you're looking for. Okay. Well, thanks for that guidance. Tell us what a big gulp decision is. Yeah. And the big gulp is is the mission that once you figure out who that future customer is, you figure out what the strategy is, and you're looking at what it's going to take, the big change you're going to have to do, this big, huge pivot, a big investment decision, man, it's awfully scary. I think one of the hardest things is, you're not going to be 100% sure that it's the right thing to do. You're pretty sure, but there's no guarantee. And oftentimes in business, we want things to work out. Like we won't make a decision until we're absolutely sure it's going to be right, perfect. And by then, by the time you actually have figured that out, it's too late. So big growth decisions are needed because given all the information you have right now, all the choices that you have, you can either stand still or you can go forward. And it requires taking a big gulp and making that jump. And that's what disruptive organizations do. They kind of take a deep breath. <laughs> the palms are sweating. The stomach is churning. It's absolutely awful. <laughs> you close your eyes and you jump. <laughs> and it may not work out. And that's okay. Because oh. you're going to get yourself up, dust yourself up, figure it out again, and jump again. Every time you fail, you'll learn something. And hopefully you do the next jump even better. Okay, well, one thing for sure, and I, and you've identified this in your book, you, you use several examples, and we see it all over in industry, we see it all over in our lives, is uh, change is happening every day, and disruption is happening every day, and I like this focus on growth, on breakthrough growth, and maintaining real growth, and this mindset really helps you move through that, through that pathway of saying, well, how do we do it? Now, from your experience, Charlene, why do some companies make this transformation and they're successful in it, moving through the change, through disruption, being the ones doing the disrupting versus being the ones getting disrupted, and those that don't, those that struggle through the transformation? Well, again, we talked a little bit about it, that the strategy is focused on that future customer. Then they also have a leadership team that's really focused on driving everybody towards that objective and creating a movement, understanding that they have to show up as leaders in a very different way. But they also have a third component, is that their culture is aligned and is intentionally created to go after that future customer and to to thrive with what I call flux, with lots of change. These disruptive organizations have a lot of flux and they're able to deal with it, and organizations that don't thrive 
with disruption are what I call stuck. So they're stuck and they, it's very hard for them to be able to take on new changes and especially to take on big changes. I, I worked with one organization that I talked about in the book who said, oh yeah, we did this. We, we, we did this huge move and it was really successful, but it took a lot out of us and we're still recovering from it. And I asked the chief strategy officer, like, well, that's fantastic. How long ago was this? It was, oh, two years ago. And I'm, I'm kind of like shaking my head going, man, if your cycle time for making change is two years, this is not good news. It's guaranteed your customers in the market is moving much faster than that. So when you think about how well you can create disruptive changes, the disruptive organizations don't necessarily make bigger changes. They make a lot of small changes constantly, and they're constantly feeling paranoid that what they're doing today isn't good enough, so they're constantly looking for ways to do things better. And that's a complete mindset that's just like these stuck organizations. Okay, so I'm uh, really trying to zero in on these. By the way, how did you come up with Flux? <laughs> Where did... <laughs> The flux I was organization. Of, I think the flux capacitor from Back to the Future or something. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, more than anything else is that it's, it's the flux between you know highs and lows. And what I found is that disruptive organizations actually do go through a cycle of change and then they stop creating new status quo. They're literally checking around. Like, okay, we just ran really fast for a hundred meters. Okay, everybody here. Is everybody here. Okay, great. Now we're going to run again. We're going to dash again another 100 meters. They stop, make sure. Are we all around here? So these cycles of flux, mm. of constant change and coming back. And so that's what flux looks like. And so you look at their paces of change. They have these areas of recovery built in, but they also don't stay there for very long. They're often going again. Okay, good. Oh, that's fun. And the, nothing like a good flux capacitor, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, repetition is wonderful. So you said there are three things that are really central to being successful in a, a, a transformation. One is really zeroing in on the future customers. So you have a target where you're going at and you're thinking about growth. Second is it's got to become a movement so people can really engage around it. And the third, I, I'm not sure I've got that. Did you say there there's a leader component, a leadership component there? Or? Yeah, the second is a leadership, the oh. movement, and the Third is a culture. Again, a culture that thrives with flux. So strategy, leadership, and culture look really different in disruptive organizations because they approach those three things in a very different way than non-disruptive organizations. Peter Drucker had a great saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And first of all, that assumes that there was a strategy for culture to eat. A lot of times people are trying to change a culture without that foundation of a strategy. Like what are you trying to accomplish with your culture? And the hard part about culture is changing it and making sure that you're being very intentional to go after the right activities, the right beliefs and behaviors, because that is what culture is made up of, just beliefs and behaviors. If you have a culture that you don't think is right and geared towards thriving with flux and being able to chase after your future customers, then you need to systematically change your beliefs and behaviors. So they are oriented in the right direction. So as we think about a flux culture, what are some of the characteristics that you've seen that allow a flux culture to thrive? Yeah, I found three beliefs in particular that were common across disruptive organizations. The first one is a belief of openness, that information sharing and more open and transparent decision-making processes really help develop trust and accountability in an organization. And we have better trust you have it's clear who's accountable for what, then you can move a lot faster. The second one is agency, that people feel like they are owners in the business and therefore they are able to take action because of the openness that's there. And agency is different than being empowered. Empowered says that somebody gives you power, so you're waiting for somebody to, to give you permission. Agency says you have all the power already vested in you. Um, you have everything that's there. And you can claim ownership and take accountability for the actions you take. And the third belief is a bias for action. As soon as you get enough data to make a decision, you're going to go. You can't stand to stand still because your customers are moving faster and further away from you. So you have to constantly chase after them. 
So as soon as you get minimally viable data, is what I call it, you're going to be going. So openness, agency, and the bias for action are three key characteristics and beliefs of disruptive organizations. Oh boy, that's powerful. When those are when those things are developed within a culture, they really make a difference, don't they? Yeah, they do. And and I really was struggling with this for a while. I was like, okay, what are these characteristics? And at one point, somebody said, oh, it's definitely agile processes. Mm -hmm. I go, well, that's that's true for some, but agile is just one business method. It's a process that you use. And I can point to a lot of organizations who are, quote, agile, who are not disruptive. Hmm. So it's just one way to manifest some of these ideas. But if you don't have a belief of openness and agency, the bias for action, which is where agility of agile processes work, it's it's very, very different. So, again, I think agile is fantastic, but it's not the secret sauce. It's not the magic easy button that everyone keeps looking for. Okay, so Charlene, how do you hardwire a flux culture into your organization? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's a little hard to say. Flux culture. The thing here is you need an operating system. I call it the culture operating system. Hmm. And it's one thing that you can build and hardwire those beliefs and those behaviors into three areas. Your organization, your structure, how you organize people, where you put them and how they relate to each other. And you can do that with your process. And I think the most fascinating area is with your lore, L-O-R-E. And these are the rituals, the symbols, and the stories that you tell each other. And I find that disruptive organizations are very systematic, very intentional in building these beliefs into these three areas. All right, into the openness and the fact you have agency and then I have a bias for action. That's right. All right, well, that's uh, really terrific. So uh, as we think about this, how can leaders master a new way of developing digital and social relationships for their businesses through customers and clients? Well, I think in many ways, the relationships that leaders have is really built on their ability to see a change, communicate that change, and inspire people to follow them to make that change happen. And the way that we develop relationships today aren't just face-to-face. They're also through these digital and social channels. And what I find so often is that leaders are very, very reluctant to move into and using these digital sources as a way to communicate and then to develop relationships. Uh, one person asked me, you know, what, who would be interested in seeing my lunch? I mean, who cares what I have for lunch? Because their, their perception is people are just sharing lunches on, on Instagram and on the social channels. And I go, I, I totally hear you on this. I have no interest in what you have for lunch. <laughs> what I really care about is what you talked about over lunch. And that's the difference between using social and digital for personal communications and your network and versus leading with them. And when you show up as a leader, you're thinking and putting first and foremost, what kind of relationship do I want to build with my followers? What do they need to hear from me today? The customers or my employees what do they need to hear from me today as a leader in order to be more focused and to know that they're doing the right thing or how they need to be changing what they're doing to be successful? So being able to use these tools just elevates your and takes your leadership to a completely different level. To be a successful leader today, you really have to learn how to manage and, and to master these tools to be the most effective leader you can. This is such a jump for so many people because it's so hard to develop a relationship, to feel close to somebody through the internet, through an email or, you know, something else. Have you had a struggle with that at all? The difference between kind of a one-on-one, seeing somebody, their personality, seeing their face versus digital? Well, I think it's always a lot easier once you have that face-to-face connection to continue it in the digital space. Okay. So you think about our friends that we've made from long ago, but they live an ocean away, a continent away. We maintain connections with them through phone calls, through emails, through posts on Facebook, through Instagram pictures. This is the way that we connect with them now. And that's how we will continue to connect on a professional level too as well. But one of the things I I really think about is it's a different type of relationship. It doesn't replace it. But it can be still really, really effective. 
because for, for one simple thing, if you're in a large organization, if you're a leader of more than like 20 people, it's hard to see every single one of them individually, but they still all need to hear from you as their leader. So how do you do that? And digital is one of the most effective ways because they hear from you every single day that this is why we're here. This is our purpose and what we're being focused on. One of my favorite examples of that is the LinkedIn uh, CEO, Jeff Weiner. And he has this habit of every time you see him, he, the first thing he says, hi, I'm Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn. Our mission at LinkedIn is to connect the world's professionals. One of our top values is numbers first. And he says this all the time, internally, externally. And some one day, an employee asked him, Jeff, we know this. Why do you keep saying this? When are you going to stop saying this? <laughs> and he says, I will stop saying it when people stop looking surprised. And I think that's so true that we as leaders think that we say something once and everyone's heard it. And that's not true. We, we forget. We get distracted. We focus on the things that are in front of us instead of the things that, are, that need to be future thinking strategically. So we need to be reminded why we're here, how we're working together. And frankly, we want to hear from our leaders. How are we doing along our path? How am I doing? And the only way to scale that leadership in this very complex world now, because business is so much more complex, is to use these digital tools. This is the thing. We, we all do this as leaders. I can't think of a single leader who doesn't use social media in their personal lives. But when it comes to being a leader, they shut it off. And like, if you could stand next to somebody and say something to them, what would you say? Okay, now say those same things in these visual channels. So it's just, it's in a different channel, but you still say the same things to them. It's really the whole package and life has changed and we want to get our message out to as many people as possible and really hard to do that one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I have one CEO that said, insisted, you know, I look people in the eye and I shake their hands and I went, that's fantastic. We have 10,000 employees. You can't do that for 10,000 employees. So how are you going to literally, digitally shake their hand, look them in the eye, and make them have that, give them that same sense of feeling that you are there for them? Yeah, that's a wonderful perspective. I am stunned at how fast time goes. We're done with our show today. <laughs> Can you believe that? Man, that just fl flew right <laughs> No, through. we need more time. This is so much fun talking to you. <laughs> oh, I know. Same here. <laughs> Any final tips that you would like to leave with our listeners today about disruption or about being successful in business or how to really have breakthrough growth? What are your thoughts? Any final tips? Yeah, one final thing is it's hard and lonely being a disruptor. You oftentimes feel like you're the only person in the organization that can see this future, see this opportunity. And you're either thinking, how do I see something that no one else does? Oh, I'm crazy. And so my, my tip here is to go find your other disruptors in your organization, find people outside of it. I am starting a new community to help people just find other disruptors uh, locally and, and hopefully in the online communities too as well. And that is called Quantum Network. Uh, the URL is quantum network. Dot com. It's free to join. We have content and hopefully you can find other like-minded souls and people because my mission here is to create as many disruptive leaders as possible, support them in their quest to create that exponential growth that they see as possible in their organizations, but also in their communities and society. Because, well, frankly, we have a lot of change that needs to be done, a lot of problems that need to be solved, and we need more disruptive leaders to be able to make that change happen. Terrific idea. So fun. Well, great. So how can people find out about what you're doing and about your quantum groups together? You just talked about it a second ago, but tell us about that. Yeah, you can follow me and find me on my website. It's charlinglee.com. My name, C-H-A-R-O-E-N-E-L-I.com. And you can find more about quantum at quantum-networks, with an S, dot com. Okay, well, thank you, Charlene, for being a part of this show today. It has been fun. Thank you so much again for having me on the show. Uh, you bet. Well, what a great and productive is this has been today. Uh, I don't think I've ever had one that's gone faster. <laughs> we certainly wish you all the best as you're making a difference in the world today and helping people with change and disruption and, and leaving the world a better place. Great going. Thank you. And to all of our listeners, never forget, you too, can make such a difference every single day of your life. And so we wish you the very best as you continue to, as Charlene and I were just preparing for this podcast show today, we were talking about becoming your best and how becoming your best, the spirit 
is at the very heart of uh, disruption. It's the very heart of growth. It's this way of thinking. What does my best look like? And as we think that way, that helps us start thinking about all of these issues we've been talking about today. This is what you're doing, you wonderful listeners. It's as you think this way, you're changing lives, you're changing yours for good, but also every single person that you meet. Well, we wish each one of you a great day. This is Steve Schallenberger with Becoming Your Best Global Leadership, signing off. Thank you for listening. Would you like help to apply the 12 principles of highly successful leaders in your life, in your family, or in your organization? Call us today at 888-690-8764 to speak with a helpful representative to evaluate your situation and how we can help. Or you can visit becomingyourbest.com. Whether it's a corporate training event, keynote, workshop, trainer certification, or personal coaching, it would be our pleasure to serve your needs. Once again, call 888-690-8764 or visit becomingyourbest.com today.